Hi guys. Thank you for sticking with me through this long strange trip where we are back in the city of Cusco, Peru. A small interruption to our Amazon adventure in Peruvian plunge. So we're going to call this our Cusco interlude here in the crack between the worlds. So uh, we're going to pick up our story on uh, June 19th to July 3rd. So I was actually there for two weeks stuck in Cusco, Peru, and that's what this is going to be mashed up in. Now we're going to start before we dive in with this quote from Joseph Conrad in The Heart of Darkness from 1902. <clears throat> at the very end of Heart of Darkness. I found myself in the sepulchral city resenting the sight of people hurrying through the streets to filch a little money from each other, to devour their infamous cookery, to gulp their unwholesome beer, to dream their insignificant and silly dreams. They trespassed upon my thoughts. They were intruders whose knowledge of life was to me an irritating pretense because I felt so sure they could not possibly know the things I knew. <coughs> their bearing which was simply the bearing of commonplace individuals going about their business in the assurance of perfect safety it was offensive to me like the outrageous flauntings of folly in the face of a danger that it is unable to comprehend. I had no particular desire to enlighten them, but I did have some difficulty in restraining myself from laughing in their faces so full of stupid self-importance. I dare say I was not very well at that time. I tottered about the streets, grinning bitterly at perfectly respectable persons. I admit my behavior was inexcusable, but then my temperature was seldom normal in those days. Okay, coming up to June 19th in Cusco, Peru. <clears throat> So much for taking the Peruvian Amazon by storm, I thought, as I licked my wounds and mapped out my next strategy over a real cup of coffee with real milk in a real bakery surrounded by unreal tourists. When I had waken up in my igloo of a hotel room that chilly gray morning in Cusco, all I had in my poison arrow quiver to shoot down big oil was some vague whisper from spirit that I needed to find a way into the Amaracari communal reserve deep within the off-limits heart of the Mother of God. And to do that even, I had to get permission from four puny little cop bureaucrats who probably knew as much about the heart of Amaracari as they did about the heart of Central Park in New York City. Knowing in my heart that this thicket of Peruvian red tape would be harder to hack through than a patch of Amazonian stinging nettles, I nonetheless steeled myself to play the game by the rules. The emails I had sent to bureaucracy number three had been bounced back as undeliverable. The three phone numbers I had would ring off the hook, and the Puerto Maldonado office had been shut down at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday morning. Just trying to find the address of the Cusco office took up half my morning. A kindly tour operator whose office advertised trips into the Amazon dug around on his computer and produced an address on some out-of-the-way side street miles away from the nerve center of downtown. It was mid-afternoon before I had negotiated my way through the maze of streets and miscommunications with cab drivers to finally arrive at the address to find 
Of course, a locked door with absolutely no sign when or if the elusive employees had any intention of returning. In desperation, I called Waldo, the tour guide I had met my last night at Manu Wildlife Center who had sent me off on this wild goose chase. He assured me that if I could hang on until Monday morning, he would have someone meet me at the office. <clears throat> As pure chance would have it, I had stumbled innocently into Cusco on the first day of the city's single biggest party of the year. The five-day completely over-the-top celebration of E.T. Rimey in five solid days of non-stop partying, revelry, dancing in the streets, parades, drinking, and general mayhem and madness, I never really figured out what E.T. Rami was supposed to be celebrating. I knew it had something to do with the Inca's celebration of the solstice, the winter solstice, as we were south of the equator, but we were so close to the equator that there couldn't have been 20 minutes worth of difference in sunlight between June 21st and December 21st. As is true with any other religious tradition, this once sacred holiday had devolved into the flimsy excuse to blow off work and get shit-faced for five days. <clears throat> I could spend several chapters trying to describe the Peruvian plunge into Bacnalian madness I witnessed over those next five days, but since it has exactly nothing whatever to do with kicking Big Oil out of the Amazon jungle, keep in mind Cusco is on another planet than the Amazon. I will save that tale for another book. I will, however, however, give you this one report about the Saturday morning parade. By and large, the Saturday morning parade, like the other dozen or so parades, I lost count, during the five-day party was the celebration of the surrounding village's Inca-based culture a seemingly endless train of dance troops dressed in their most brightly colored finery, pranced and pirouetted around the Plaza de Artemis in a joyous but politically inert display of all-around good cheer. As fun as it was, after the first dozen or so dance troops, which looked a whole hell of a lot like the same groups of dancers I had seen the night before, I was growing a little bit antsy and was even thinking about bowing out of the festivities and retreating into an internet cafe. Then, just as I was about to leave, things started to turn just a little bit weird, as things are likely to do at the most unexpected times in Peru. Here, in the order as they appeared between the innocent and innocuous dance displays, were some of my favorite floats. <clears throat> a 20-foot tall Indian peasant woman, complete with baby, of course, sat in a market stall surrounded by her meager stores of fruits and vegetables. She was talking on her Motorola cell phone while all around her danced a bunch of peasants being beaten by club-wielding police. This was the celebration of a village called Santiago. <clears throat> a motorcycle in the shape of a giant pig came rolling down the street. Riding the motorcycle were three pig-faced grim reapers. Hanging from a pole held by one of the grim reapers was a toy stuffed bloody pig in a noose. Behind the motorcycle flew a giant paper mache airplanes, oink airlines, piloted by a pig in an Uncle Sam top hat. The float was titled Epidema Forever USA. A fellow parade watcher explained to me that this was a, 
was a float claiming quite vividly that gringos were to blame for bringing the dreaded pandemic of swine flu to Peru. Next, Proyecto SOS was obviously an environmental group working to stop deforestation. Their float consisted of a dying kapok tree, much like my old friend from Anu Wildlife Center, full of anguished spirits of the forest. Pushing the float were two machine gun wielding thugs, though I have no clue who the thugs were supposed to be, assumedly Alan Garcia's government. Next, we had the Allegoria Lay 1090. The story, the allegory, of the odious piece of legislation introduced by Garcia that rolled out the red carpet to big oil. The same piece of legislation that ultimately led to the Bagua massacre. The float showed accurately a giant chainsaw with the word gobierno, government, ablazoned across it. The chainsaw and the tree it was cutting down were both dripping blood. The tree was screaming in agony as jaguars and macaws fled in terror. A desperate leprechaun, I think they're called mookies in Peru, was trying to hold up the tree. This was the float sponsored by an environmental group called I mass Mary. Next, one of the biggest floats, and one of the most boring, was sponsored by the Boleto Turistico del Cusco, the $63 pass that all tourists who want to visit Cusco's biggest tourist traps must purchase. I was glad to see the money was being put to such a great use. Next, a giant black rat, President Garcia, rolled into sight. The devilish rodent was guarding the rights of, of Amazon natives. All around the giant rat, not a paca, raged a battle of dancers between machine gun toting soldiers and spear chucking Indians. The bloody corpse of a slain cop was being bandied about with an Indian in war paint gnawing at his throat. Emblazoned across the float bearing the giant rat was a banner reading, Que no vuelva a ocurrir, roughly translated, translated as, This will never happen again. The float was met with general support and applause among the audience that the armed cops lining the street appeared to be a wee bit nervous. Next, a huge overloaded dump truck surrounded by orange vested monsters rolled into view. A huge, overweight, and obviously drunk boss man was splayed across the hood of the truck, clearly indicating that someone was getting fat and drunk off all the hard work of an army of underpaid workers. At first, I thought this was a protest of the highway from hell, but a fellow standing next to me explained that it was a protest against some planet-eating gold mine somewhere in the country. That limited it to about 200 candidates, no doubt. Next, the single biggest, grandest, and most complicated float of all, dominated by an ear of corn the size of a nuclear power plant silo, had something to do with some kind of water war going on between Bolivia and Peru. The guy next to me tried to explain what I was looking at, but his Spanish was way out of my league. Whatever the float was about, it was met with great applause. And bringing up the rear of the parade was a fairly simple and straightforward float. 
It was a huge, hideous bug the size of a flatbed truck that looked like a cross between a horsefly, a dragonfly, and a mosquito. It had APRA, President Garcia's political party, the Alianza Political Revolucionario America, emblazoned in blood red letters across it. The ghoulish, bloodthirsty insect was gorging off a pile of dead, bloody Indians. Hmm, can't get much more straightforward than that. The parade began to wind down and the overheated crowd began to disperse. I had struck up a friendship in Spanglish with the young man standing beside me, my translator describing the floats to me. Judging by his applause for the various floats protesting Amazon deforestation, gold mining, and Garcia's giveaway of the Amazon to Big Oil, the guy was clearly on the side of the natives in the Bagua massacre. I figured I had found a Peruvian who actually got it. Maybe there was hope for the revolution after all, I told myself. If we could just get more folks like this young man to join. We continued our conversation in Spanglish and, as conversations always do within the first 10 minutes of two people getting to know each other, this one turned to what the guy did to earn his living with the same proud and cocky attitude displayed by the young hydroelectric engineer I had met on the bus along the highway from hell. The young man told me, and I could not make this up, guys, that he was a geological engineer on the new Transoceanic Highway. In other words, he was one of the engineers orchestrating the absolute orgy of destruction I had witnessed in the hills above Okangate. Oh, really, I said. I just came through that pass a few days ago. That is quite the construction job you have there. Yes, isn't it? Isn't it, he said, beaming with pride. When I started work there two years ago, three cars per day could get through that road. Today, 12 buses make the trip to Puerto Maldonado every day. Next year, it will be a real highway. Yes. <clears throat> Shaking off a weekend of revelry, I awoke bright and early on Monday morning to be sure I would be at my 10 a.m. appointment with bureaucrat number three, B3, well ahead of time. Once again, I negotiated my way across to the isolated address and was, in fact, there at 9.30 a.m. to find a locked door and no sign of when or if the employees ever intended to return. I was still sitting there in front of the locked door as my sure thing appointment came and went. As I was sizing up the building, trying to decide between dynamite or plastic explosives as the best way to blow it up, one of the building's employees actually showed up. He was surprised to find anyone waiting there as he was just stopping by for a minute before the next parade started. I introduced myself in Spanglish and told him what I wanted, at which point he explained to me that B3 had moved to another, more convenient office building downtown a few weeks before. Leaving their logo behind on the door of the abandoned office without one word of notice that they had moved or bothering to mention the move on their website. I flagged down a taxi, raced across town, and arrived at the new offices at 11 a.m. on a weekday to find, as if you don't know, a locked door and no sign of when or if the employees had any intention of returning. The nice woman in the office next door said I had missed B3 by five minutes. He had waited and waited for the flaky gringo for 45 minutes, but had given up and headed to a parade. 
checking my email later that evening, there was a letter from the guy explaining that he had to return to Puerto Maldonado, but he promised me that, I, that if I could hang out in Cusco for five days, he would meet me at 5 p.m. on Friday. It was before noon on Monday. With nothing better to do, I followed the lead of 500,000 other Cuscanos. I went to a parade. <clears throat> I blew off that entire week by going to parades and actually being in one and getting my picture on Peruvian national TV. Catching up on my book and generally just killing time in my revolution and conscious as my revolution and consciousness took a hiatus. Friday afternoon rolled around. I put on my cleanest duds and made myself look almost human for my meeting with B3, which I had been trying to organize now for 10 days. Wanting to be 100% sure I would not miss the guy, I arrived at his office 30 minutes ahead of our scheduled appointment to find a locked door with no sign that anybody who worked there had any intention of returning. Five o'clock came and went, 5.30 rolled around, and the security guard announced that he was locking the place up for the weekend. He was sure the office would be open bright and early on Monday morning if I wanted to return then. And that was when I hit my gringo wall. Fuck the Peruvians. I had gone way above and beyond the call of duty to meet with some puny little bureaucrat who probably spoke no English anyway for what would have been, no doubt, a three-minute conversation so he could sign off on some goddamn little slip of paper giving me permission to walk into a one-million-acre rainforest. I almost felt sorry for Hunt Oil Company. If this is what I had to put up with to take a fucking walk through the woods, imagine what those poor planet eaters had to go through to get permission to blow off 12,000 sticks of dynamite and carve out 100 helicopter landing pads in the place. So I did what any gringo would do under the circumstances. I went looking for another gringo who could help me get into a Maracari. It took me two days to track one down. Joaquin Rivers, not his real name, is the brains and the money behind the four-year-old C-R-E-E-S, Crease, Conservation Research and Environmental Education towards Sustainability Foundation, which is described on its website as, quote, a not-for-profit charitable organization working to bring economic, social, and environmental harmony to the Manu region, close quote, which achieves its vision by, quote, protecting the incredible diversity of the region and working with local communities to generate truly sustainable development that creates decent livelihoods in harmony with the natural environment, close quote. I had been in Peru a grand total of five days before the name Joaquin Rivers first crossed my radar. Since then, his name had cropped up at least three more times and would continue to appear on a regular basis <clears throat> from the guy's friends and foes, which were frequently hard to tell apart alike. For a 31-year-old resident of England and self-described quote, behind-the-scenes kind of guy who owned a relatively obscure and remote eco-lodge cum research center called Manu Learning Center, Joaquin Rivers had built quite a public name and rumor-filled reputation for himself. Listening to people talk about the guy behind his back, I could not tell if I were dealing with Indiana Jones or Donald Trump. 
I had heard him variously described by his colleagues as, quote, arrogant by the first two of his friends who mentioned his name to me, an anthropologist, a crusading, tree-hugging environmentalist, which I think is how he sees himself, or at least wants others to perceive him, a sellout to big tourism, no doubt to his dreams of building a boutique eco-lodge on the banks of the Madre de Dios, a millionaire venture capitalist, whatever that means, <clears throat> a multi-millionaire rich heir with vague ties to the McDonald's hamburger fortune. He wishes, and my favorite rumor, completely unsubstantiated, but not totally out of line with the other rumors, an over-the-top schemer who once dreamed of bulldozing an airport into the very heart of my new national park to bring plane loads of rich eco-tourists to sneeze all over the we-don't-want-to-be-contacted Stone Age tribes in the pristine wilderness. As this village myth goes, he was chased out of Manu because of his ballsy, less-than-sustainable plan. <clears throat> if there is any truth to the Manu airport myth, perhaps it is due to some kind of ironically hilarious karma that Hunt Oil wants to build a heliport and ram a seismic testing line across his property along the Mother of God River as a slap on the wrist from the universe for such off-the-map arrogance. Regarding that term arrogance, I just want to make it arrogantly clear for the record that in my own flagrantly arrogant hambone way that I think the term is a compliment as long as one's arrogance is directed against the really arrogant planet-eating bastards such as oil companies, rainforest beef ranchers, and airport developers in national parks. Some of my favorite chicken little heroes, including Terrence McKenna and Graham Hancock, are all arrogant bastards, and this arrogant bastard salutes them for it. In my own arrogant way, I did not, and still do not, give a shit how arrogant Joaquin Rivers was or is. I needed his help in two ways. First, I needed a guide into a Maracari without dealing with the various arrogant, bullshit Peruvian bureaucracy. Secondly, I needed a bed, meals, and a quiet place to write for one to three months for ten bucks a day, for which I was willing to volunteer my services wherever they were needed most at Manu Learning Center. Despite whatever trash folks want to talk about Joaquin behind his back, the man was kind enough to take two hours out of his overbooked schedule on a beautiful Sunday morning in Cusco to welcome a total stranger into his office, which, with the possible exception of one Hunt Oil contractor, is more than I can say for 99% of the folks I have met in Peru. <clears throat> Regarding the guide, Joaquin assured me he had the perfect man for the job, a Haro camped Indian from the village of Shintuya named Ramon. Regarding the cheap place to stay, he promised me he could fix me up for a 10-day trial run. As far as extending that to 30 to 90 days, I would have to fill out a scholarship application, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, that would have to be approved by the CRIAS Board of Directors, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, of which he was the president, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Although Joaquin was careful to make me no promises beyond 10 days, 
all the wink winking and nudge nudging going on in his office gave me the presumptuous confidence to bring two bags of cannonballs every one of my worldly possessions in Peru to Manu Learning Center with me when I plunged into the jungle a second time. To help me do just that, he said we would have a private tour bus waiting for me at the crack of dawn on Wednesday morning, just three days away. For the record, I can guarantee you that Joaquin would vehemently deny any wink-winking and nudge-nudging on his part and that any misperception of his limited promises to me were entirely my fault. And who knows, he could be right. <clears throat> Between shameless bouts of name-dropping of all the important people he knew, multiple references to his Trump-esque escapades as a wheeling and dealing maverick young venture capitalist in London and New York, and bandy rooster strutting tales of his fearless exploits standing up to rock-wielding illegal loggers in the Peruvian jungle, threatening to bash his head in, Joaquin actually found some time in his two-hour Good Morning Vietnam manic monologue to talk about the newest nemesis in his life, Hunt Oil Company. <clears throat> Leaving this dull-witted, ignorant old liberal arts major behind in the dust, the manic young tree-hugging venture capitalist with genuine awe in his voice regaled me with details, none of which I understood at the time, of how those fucking brilliant capitalists at Hunt Oil had raised more than $800 million in a few weeks. I have no clue what he was referring to here by investing in all kinds of Peruvian bonds and pension funds, whatever those were. Although he had left me back at the, in, in the starting gate, I think the upshot of all this collusion and commingling of funds between Hunt Oil and Big Money and Lima meant, according to Joaquin's theory, that if the Peruvian government ever did try to tighten the reins on Hunt Oil, which is doubtful, they would have to eat a ton of shit from a bunch of pissed off big time businessmen in Lima who are a lot harder for the Peruvian army to shoot out of helicopters than a bunch of Indians in Bagua. Or something like that, anyway. <clears throat> Before I had time to straighten out all of this web of intrigue regarding Hunt Oil, Joaquin was yanked away from his discussion with me to attend a luncheon meeting with other VIP Hunt bashers to discuss various local strategies to keep the vermin off his property. He assured me we would resume our discussion at Manu Learning Center in a few days. And oh yeah, one more thing. Could I swing by the office the next day to sign a few forms before catching the bus on Wednesday morning? Just a technicality. Details, details. The busy, young, tree-hugging venture capitalist shook my hand and was hustled into a car waiting at the curb for him with its motor running and three people waiting for him inside. Joaquin Rivers, it was clear, was a man to be reckoned with. <clears throat> The next day, I returned to his office to pay my $70 bus fare and to sign the following statements. Drugs are not tolerated at Manu Learning Center. Visitors found consuming or in possession of illegal drugs. Of course, neither San Pedro nor Ayahuasca would be in that group, though weed would be will be expelled from the facility. Violation of this policy will be reported to the local police. Gross misconduct, 
including possession of drugs, will be misconduct deemed to be so serious that Crees can no longer tolerate the presence of the visitor. A visitor who commits such an act will be evicted from Manu Learning Center. Blah, blah, blah. I hadn't even kissed the bride yet, and cracks were already forming in my honeymoon with Joaquin Rivers and the Crees Foundation. And... Uh, okay, one, I'm going to do one more little part, and then we're going to have to break this in half. <clears throat> in my ramblings around Cusco while waiting and waiting and waiting for this ice jam to break up, I had been passing this coca leaf museum that had inexplicit, inexplicit, <laughs> that had inexplicably as it was, after all, dedicated to the coca leaf god, a picture of a psilocybin magic mushroom on its sign. Strangely, I had never thought to investigate the legality or illegality of psilocybin in Peru, where coca leaves, ayahuasca, and San Pedro cactus, call it peyote, Cactus are completely legal, while a baggie of weed will get your ass thrown in prison for five years. I guess with all the shaman shops and ayahuasca tours and San Pedro vision quests available to tourists, that the mushroom god was quietly sitting out the silliness on the sidelines, which is one more reason I'm attracted to him. I asked the proprietor of the Coca Leaf Museum whether magic mushrooms were illegal in Peru. He looked at me uncomprehendingly as if I had just asked him if beer was illegal in his country. Why would mushrooms be illegal, he asked, genuinely surprised. Who knows, I said, but in my country you can get in deep shit with the cops. They are even illegal in Holland, where everything, including weed, is legal. It's local, he said. I asked him if he sold magic mushrooms in his shop. Why do you think I would sell mushrooms here, he asked me, standing under a picture of a giant magic mushroom on the sign in front of his business. If you want to buy mushrooms, go to the market, like everyone else. The market? You mean... Where I buy tomatoes? Si, claro, he said, dismissing me like the hopeless ignoramus I was. Next thing he knew, the stupid gringo would be asking if he could find bread at a bakery. <clears throat> I walked the dozen blocks to the market, passing a half dozen shamans offering $85 ayahuasca or San Pedro sessions, your choice, and arrived at the local market where the real Peruvians shop. I finagled my way through the endless morass of stalls filled with all sorts of strange and exotic-looking fruits and vegetables and herbs and roots, wondering where I was going to begin my search as I scanned stall after stall on the lookout for my little friends, I stumbled instead upon a stall offering San Pedro cactus. Behind the stacks of San Pedro, fresh, dried, powdered, or liquefied, I was astonished but not surprised somehow to see row upon row of bottles of pre-made and pre-packaged ayahuasca for sale. Now I got it. These shamans ran down to the market, loaded up on a few bottles of San Pedro juice or ayahuasca for about six bucks a shot, then led dim-witted tourists on $85 ayahuasca journeys. Not a bad way to pocket about $500 on a slow Monday night. Jesus, what a scam. As long as I was standing there, 
I may as well buy a bottle of ayahuasca and a baggie of dried San Pedro like I was picking up a dozen eggs and a loaf of bread at a 7-Eleven in the U.S. The nice lady at the market ran through a few instructions. Remember, no food for 24 hours, and that is enough ayahuasca for two people, but only enough San Pedro for one person. There was only one product she did not have, unfortunately, mushrooms. She assured me if I came back in December after the rains had returned to the cow pastures, I could load up on all the mushrooms I could carry. I headed out the front door of the market and walked right past three cops with my bag full of San Pedro and ayahuasca, a bag which would have held mushrooms as well with absolutely zero fear of being hassled as I was doing nothing illegal in Peru. Of course, if I had been busted with a bag of the dreaded killer drug, marijuana, I would have been prison bound for five years. On the way back to my hotel, I paused at the shaman shop and picked up a couple of $5 Ikaro CDs. Ikaros are the songs that shamans sing to ayahuasca drinkers to call in the spirits. Six bucks for the juice, five bucks for the CD. Let's see, I just saved 74 bucks. Hell, I ought to go into the ayahuasca tour business myself. And we are going to pause in our Cusco interlude. We're going to take a brief interlude and uh, reload the camera before it shuts off on us. Coming right back for the second half of the Cusco interlude.